Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we have some follow-up GeForce GTX 1660 Ti content. Now, the meat of this video is a 33 game benchmark, but at the end of the video I also want to discuss pricing, namely the whole Vega 56 debacle. Anyway, for the benchmark portion of the video, the focus will be on the 1440p resolution. Uh, I do have all the data for 1080p. Uh, that was also covered in the day one review. We discussed all the graphs there. We're not going to do that again because there's a lot of information to go over. And I think the 1440p resolution probably makes the most sense if we had to pick one of the two. Having said that, all 66 graphs covering the 1080p and 1440p resolutions for all 33 games tested will be available for free on our Patreon page. So if you do want to have a look at the 1080p data, you can follow the link in the video description. That'll head you over to our Patreon page and you can sift through the 33 graphs covering 1080p there. Okay, so the day one review looked closely at a dozen of the more recently released games, such as Resident Evil 2, Metro Exodus, and a few others. But with just a 12 game sample, I was keen to see how the 1660 Ti stacked up in a much wider range of games. So today we're doing that. The performance breakdown graphs include the 12 games we've already looked at, along with 21 new games that we haven't. And for 12 of those 21 titles, we'll investigate the results a little more closely in this video. Before that though, a few quick notes on the test system. We're using a Core i9-9900K clocked at 5 GHz with 32 GB of DDR4-3200 memory. As for the drivers, we use Adrenaline 2019 Edition 19.2.2 for the Radeon GPUs and Game Ready 418.91 WHQL for the GeForce GPUs. Okay, let's get into the results. First up we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey and despite being an AMD sponsored title it does prefer Nvidia hardware and we see that here as the GTX 1660 Ti is able to match Vega 64 and it was also 42% faster than the RX 590. When compared to other GeForce parts it matched the GTX 1070 and it was just 11% slower than the RTX 2060. Next up, we have Strange Brigade, and this is another AMD sponsored title, but unlike Assassin's Creed Odyssey, this one does play nice with AMD hardware. Interestingly, whereas the RTX 2070 is a good bit faster than the GTX 1080, the GTX 1660 Ti is actually a little bit slower than the GTX 1070. Still, overall performance at 1440p was good, and the new affordable Turing GPU also edged out the RX 590. Moving on, we have Star Wars Battlefront 2, and here the GTX 1660 Ti demonstrates how it's clearly a class ahead of the GTX 1060 6GB and RX 590, offering over 40% more performance. Basically, in this title, we're looking at GTX 1070 or Vega 56 Lite performance with a healthy 68 FPS on average. Dirt 4 using CMAA is a bit of an AMD special, but even so, the GTX 1660 Ti is still able to edge out the RX 590, Though with just a single frame in it, it's fair to say they provided the exact same experience. The new $280 Turing GPU also roughly matched the GTX 1070 Ti and impressively this meant it was just 5% slower than the GTX 1080. Next up we have For Honor. Here we see the GTX 1660 Ti. Sorry for all the 1660s again, but it is what it is. We see it creeping in just behind the GTX 1070, which meant it was also a few frames down on Vega 56. Even so, it's still almost 30% faster than the RX 590 and GTX 1060. Sniper Elite 4 is one of the very few games that supports DirectX 12 and actually runs better using DirectX 12. That said, the GTX 1660 Ti did trail the GTX 1070 by a small margin in this one. It was also 12% slower than Vega 56, so certainly not a bad result, but also not its best showing either. Moving on to The Witcher 3, and here we see the 1660 Ti matching the GTX 1070, as it often does. As such, it also matched Vega 56 and was 26% faster than the Radeon RX 590. But most crucially, with the game's visual settings just about maxed out, it provided a very playable 54 FPS on average at 1440p, enabling a much better gaming experience than either the RX 590 or 6GB GTX 1060. F1 fans will appreciate what the GTX 1660 Ti has to offer for less than $300 US. Basically, you're looking at performance somewhere between the GTX 1070 and 1070 Ti. The Radeon GPUs do perform very well in this title, but even so, the 1660 Ti dusted the RX 590 by a 23% margin. So, not bad that. Testing with Warhammer Vermintide 2 sees the 1660 Ti match Vega 56, and please note, 
I am using the DirectX 11 API for testing as it provided smoother performance last time we checked. That said, a few Vega users have been complaining that we're favoring NVIDIA by using DX11. That's obviously not the intention here, and as I said last time we checked, DX11 offered better frame time performance, but please note I will be retesting these GPUs with DirectX 12 to see if anything's changed. As a side note, I'm not sure if those Vega owners uh, got the memo, but Turing is pretty handy in DirectX 12 now, and Vulkan, so don't expect to see any advantages there anymore. Anyway, moving along, performance in Prey is a little down on what you might be expecting from the GTX 1660 Ti. Still with 86 FPS on average, it was well ahead of the RX 590 and GTX 1060 6GB. The 1% low result was also very solid, it just lagged behind the 1070 by a 9% margin, which I have to say was a little bit surprising. Now the second last game that we're going to look at results from is Kingdom Come Deliverance, and here the 1660 Ti can be found sitting between the 1070 and 1070 Ti, and this made it around 14 to 15% slower than the RTX 2060 and Vega 56. It also wasn't that much faster than the RX 590. Well, it was 22% faster, but given we've seen it up around 40% faster at times, a 22% margin isn't the most extreme we've seen, that's for sure. Last up, we've already seen how Warframe runs better with Pascal-based GPUs. For example, the GTX 1080 is 8% faster than the RTX 2070. And well, here the GTX 1070 was 16% faster than the 1660 Ti. In fact, the new budget Turing offering was just 9% faster than the GTX 1060 6GB. So, fairly disappointing result to end on there. And I suppose, an equally disappointing result for any Warframe fans. Okay, so jumping right into it, here's the GeForce GTX 1660 Ti versus GTX 1060 6GB. And in our day one content, we saw that the GTX 1660 Ti came out 40% faster on average when compared to the GTX 1060 6GB at 1440p. Interestingly, that figure has dropped quite a bit in the 33 game comparison. Now the 1660 Ti is just 34% faster. Admittedly though, that's still a decent margin. The reason for this is down to the selection of games, which is, I suppose, pretty obvious. In the day one content, we only included a dozen titles, and of those dozen titles, most of them, by pure chance, were more favorable to the Turing GPU. The focus was on new titles such as Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Apex Legends, Resident Evil 2, and Hitman 2, for example, and all seemed to heavily favor the 1660 Ti. However, now we've included games such as Warframe, Shadow of War, and about half a dozen other titles that saw the 1660 Ti beat the 1060 by less than 30%. So that brought the average down by 6%, making the 1660 Ti 34% faster on average. Again, not bad, given it only cost 12% more. Then we have the GTX 1070 in our day one coverage. The 1660 Ti was found to be 2% faster on average, and because of that, we noted performance to be basically the same overall. Now in our 33 game test, the 1660 Ti came out exactly level with the 1070, so they're no longer basically the same overall, they are the same. Also, this graph gives us a good idea of where Turing is much more efficient than Pascal. Of course, Turing is faster under all conditions, it's just that here we're comparing a 1920 CUDA core Pascal part with a 1536 core Turing part. Then for the RTX 2060 comparison, we see similar margins to that of the day one content. Previously, the 1660 Ti was 12% slower, and now in the 33 game comparison, that has increased ever so slightly to 14%. I'll have to go back and retest Forza Horizon 4 to try and work out what's going on there, but other than that, the only other major outliers included Warframe, Metro Exodus, and World of Tanks. The performance margin is also much the same for the Radeon RX 590 comparison. Previously we found the 1660 Ti to be 25% faster, now it's 24% faster, so much of a muchness there really. Then the margin of Vega 56 remains exactly the same at 8%, though here we do see a few examples where the GTX 1660 Ti was significantly slower. This is seen in titles such as Warframe, Strange Brigade, Battlefield 5, Dirt 4 and Resident Evil 2 for example. That said, the 1660 Ti was a wee bit faster in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Fortnite, Vermintide 2, and Apex Legends, though a mere 1% margin was seen in the last two, and that's near enough to identical performance. And finally, we have one last graph, a quick cost per frame comparison update. Here we're mostly only seeing a change of 2 to maybe 4 FPS, 
In fact, it's really only the Radeon 7 that saw a significant change in the 33-game sample. Here it stacks up much better than the previous 12-game comparison. Still, for this video, we're not really interested in Radeon 7. Rather, Vega 56 and the RX 590 and 580 play are much more significant roles in this comparison. That said, overall little has changed. The GTX 1660 Ti is just 9% more costly than the RX 580 per frame, but 12% cheaper than the RX 590 and 22% cheaper than Vega 56. And that is of course at the more typical $400 US asking price. Then compared to the RTX 2060, the cost per frame of the 1660 Ti is improved by 7%, so a solid result for the new GTX graphics card. Okay, so that's how the GeForce GTX 1660 Ti stacks up in a wide range of games, and it was interesting to see where it offered a really big gains over GPUs such as the GTX 1060 6GB, and then other games where the gains were less impressive. Speaking of the GTX 1060, the 1660 Ti did look less appealing for owners of the 6GB models in this massive benchmark comparison, but still a 34% performance boost on average Still nothing to scoff at. I think if I was currently gaming with a GTX 1060 6GB, or I suppose even a 3GB, probably doesn't really matter, and I was after something with a bit more punch, I would really consider upgrading to the GTX 1660 Ti. As I said in the day one content, it offers next tier performance, so it's a whole tier above what you get from the 1060, and it's really a small price premium to take that step up to the next tier. Of course, if you have anything faster than a 1060 or a Radeon RX 580, something faster such as Vega 56 or a GTX 1070, then I think there's really still, there's still no worthwhile upgrade choice. So the RTX cards, they're a bit, they're not, they're not great in terms of value. So yeah, still nothing really, really compelling there. Nothing GTX 1660 Ti levels of compelling and Obviously, if you have a Vega 56 or a GTX 1070 graphics card, then you would overlook the 1660 Ti as it has nothing to offer you. Then for those of you coming from a much older mid-range GPU, your choices right now, they are quite limited. They seem to be either the new GTX 1660 Ti or Vega 56. Uh, the RX 590, in my opinion, it just simply isn't fast enough uh, to be compared with the 1660 Ti or Vega 56. Obviously, it's a whole level down, and it just doesn't offer great value. There are some models that have dipped down as low as, I think it was $240 US when I was checking uh, just before putting this video together. And although it doesn't offer the same level of performance as the 1660 Ti, it does get a bit closer in terms of cost per frame at the $240 US price. But as I said, if you're looking for something that offers Vega 56 sort of performance, then yeah. Well, you're not after an RX 590. And of course, if you are looking at RX 590 type performance, well, you just buy an RX 580 because it is still much better value. You can get them quite easily for $200 and that's $40 US less. So this leaves Vega 56 and at the more typical $400 US asking price, it's really a non-contest. That said, let's just talk about Vega 56 pricing for a bit. When we were piecing our initial GTX 1660 Ti review together, major online US retailers such as Amazon and Newegg had one or two models down around $400, with the majority priced much closer to $500. That said, we felt $400 was a better price for this comparison as that is the price you should be looking at purchasing one for. Anyway, about a day before the GTX 1662 I was set to go on sale, Newegg along with a few other big online retailers saw the writing on the wall. Presumably they had quite a bit of Vega 56 stock on hand, namely the MSI Airboost model. It's an unappealing blower style card and they probably had a big order left over after the cryptocurrency collapse. So with an unknown but likely large amount of these things sitting in warehouses, they obviously knew the second a GPU that was just 10% slower on average, but at least 30% cheaper arrived, moving that stock was going to be near on impossible. So they did what all retailers do in this situation, and that was to create a fire sale. AMD caught wind of this in an effort to disrupt the GTX 1660 Ti release and potentially manipulate reviews, they promoted this deal, essentially leading reviewers and consumers on, hinting that this was a new competitive price to combat the 1660 Ti. Of course, tech news being what it is, countless media outlets reported on this as an official price cut, and well, the rest is history. 
Now, our review was spammed with comments from viewers claiming that the cost per frame analysis was misleading, biased, or incorrect, whatever you want, because Vega 56 is now $280 US, not $400. Thing is, before the review went live, I contacted AMD directly about the $280 listing on Newegg, and they said it was a limited time only deal, and it had already sold out. The MSRP hadn't changed. So that's that really. Vega 56 is still a 400-ish US dollar product and getting one for well under that price is it's gonna be very difficult. I think that's fair to say. I've also been made aware that some European retailers are really competitive with Vega pricing. Haven't looked into that too much myself. So if that is the case, well, you can take our cost per frame stuff. The FPS is there and then you can just divide the price by the FPS, that'll give you the cost per frame, and you can work out what the best value option is in your region. If it happens to be Vega, well, great, get Vega. Uh, we're certainly not against getting Vega if it's priced right. At $280 US, it would be a, a really, really good card to buy. The blower style MSI air boost that they were selling is yeah, not great, but, yeah, for $280 US, it does offer a very impressive level of performance. But anyway, don't really follow the European retailers or the pricing there. So I'm not someone you should follow if you're interested in that pricing, or at least my opinion on pricing in your region. The focus here is very much on US and then Australian pricing. Here in Australia, you're looking at spending at least $700 to nab a Vega 56 graphics card. Meanwhile, 1660 Ti models can be had for $470, so margins are the same as the US then. The GeForce GPU is at least 30% cheaper, 33% in that example. Now, if you can get a Vega 56 graphics card for $280 US or $470 Aussie, then yeah, it's worth getting, but good luck with that. Truth is, AMD can't afford to compete with the GTX 1660 Ti using Vega 56. It just costs too much to produce, which is why we knew this alleged price drop was almost certainly bogus. So having said that, don't expect a true GTX 1660 Ti competitor from AMD until Navi drops. Right now, there are currently a number of 1660 Ti graphics cards available at the $280 US MSRP. Uh, Zotac has their gaming model. MSI has the Ventus. Uh, Gigabyte's offering a base model OC card, as well as a mini ITX version. So getting a decent model for the MSRP isn't an issue. I actually really like the look of MSI's Ventus card. I have been wanting to get my hands on one of those for a review for some time now. And the 1660 Ti model looks pretty good. So. I'll do my best to get my hands on one of those ASAP for a review. As it stands, the GTX 1662 Ti really has no competition. It also has a crap name, but <laughs> let's not waste time getting into that one. Uh, yeah, I won't waste time getting into that one. I kind of want to, but maybe we'll talk about how weird Nvidia's new naming schemes are in another video. I don't know, maybe I'll touch on that in a reply in a comments episode, because quite a few of you did bring it up, and hopefully I can do one of them next week. Anyway. Like I said, uh, unless you can snap up Vega 56 for a bargain basement price, then it's really not worth considering, at least in my opinion. And the RX 590 is, well, it's really a GTX 1060 6 gigabyte competitor. So I think that's probably enough for this one. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, you know what to do. And you can subscribe for more content just like this. And if you'd like to support us more directly, you can do so via Patreon. Again, links in the video description, and you can head over there and get all the graphs uh, for all the data that we've collected for free. So you don't actually have to be a Patreon member to grab that. But of course, while you're over there, if you would like to support us, then you do get some cool perks like access to our exclusive Discord chat, monthly live streams. We will be streaming for our Patreon uh, members on Monday. So a few days from now, uh, actually, it, it'll be tomorrow when this video goes out. So tomorrow we will be streaming. We will be streaming to Patreon members, and we'll be talking about a whole heap of things. Probably the GTX 1660 Ti. Uh, Tim wants to discuss DLSS, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, should be really good. Anyway, I am waffling a bit. Thank you for watching. I am your host Steve. I'll see you again next time.